Athena goes to Sparta and inspires the young Telemachus to quickly return home and advises him on how to avoid the ambush set by the suitors. Menelaus gives Telemachus kingly gifts and sends him and Nestor's son back to Pylos. Telemachus asks Nestor's son to leave him at his ship and not take him back to Nestor's house, as to be able to quickly return home and not be hosted again by the old king. As Telemachus is praying to Athena before launching his ship, a stranger approaches and asks to sail with him. Telemachus agrees, and the prophet Theoclymenus joins him on his journey home back to Ithaca. Meanwhile, Odysseus the beggar tells the swine herd he plans to go beg from the suitors. The swine herd counsels Odysseus and then tells him his own story, and we discover that the swine herd comes from a royal line. He was a toddler, kidnapped, sold into slavery, and then purchased by Liar- Liartes, Odysseus's father, and raised by Odysseus's mother. The book ends with Telemachus returning to Ithaca and heading to home of the swineherd. Welcome to Ascend the Great Books Podcast. I'm Adam Minahan. It is so good that you're joining us again for book 15 of the Odyssey. We are approaching the end. We're, I guess, under 10 books left. So we're glad that you're joining us. If you are joining us because maybe you like hitchhikers, maybe you like bird omens, or maybe you like uh, being able to tell your hunting stories, regardless of why you have joined us, we are happy you are here to join us and send us your pictures of your guys' groups, um, maybe the different uh, translations that you guys have of the Odyssey that you guys are all reading together, uh, why you like certain translations versus why you don't like certain translations. We, we want to hear from you. Go check us out on X or Twitter or whatever they call it these days. MySpace.com is another good one for us to catch us. Um, but I'm here, as always, with my good friend, Deacon Harrison Garlic. It is great to have you here, Deacon. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate it. How is your hunting season going? Not well. I went and sat in a ground blind in the rain for about five hours before I gave up and realized this is not going to work and apparently contracted some type of lung infection while doing that. And so I spent the rest of muzzleloader season in bed with a migraine and a deep chest cough. So I am on the mend, uh, which is good. Uh, I might cough a few times on the podcast, but Hunting season is not off to a great start. What about yourself? This is the reason why, you know, this is advocacy for smoking a pipe. Because, you know, the more you can smoke a pipe, the more smoke is in your lungs, the less infections can be in your lungs. Thus, it is good to smoke a pipe. That's some real wisdom. I should just bring my Gandalf pipe out while I'm trying to uh, hunt deer. I'm sure they'll be incredibly efficacious. But yes. no, you, you've actually already had a good season. And I think you've taken your boy out. So how was muzzleloader season? Yeah, it really was good. It, like, so it was good for several reasons. One being, um, last year I took my, my oldest son out to to hunt, and we didn't we didn't get anything. Uh, he 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 saw a doe. He shot a doe. He didn't hit the vitals. We tracked. We tried to track it for about a little over four miles all around, and just could not find it, unfortunately. But this year, uh, he he shot his first first deer, and we were able to harvest it. Uh. And it was a buck. It was really cool. We saw, so we saw a huge buck uh, chasing some doe. So we slowly walked our way over towards where that was. As we were walking over there, I saw the big buck leave. Like, there's no way we're shooting. It went to the back acres. Uh, there's no way we're getting to it. So I, we kind of stood there for a little while, waited. And I said, hey, bud, I don't think we're going to be able to, you know, we should probably head back to camp. I don't think there's anything here. And he's like, okay. And as we turn around, I'm, my, my head is, is, is down and I'm just kind of talking to him and saying like, this is kind of how hunting works. Like sometimes you don't get anything, you know, and it's not called killing. It's called hunting. You know, you have to uh, be patient. And as I'm sitting there talking to him about this, he goes, dad, 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 dad. you know, like, <laughs> you know, freaking out. And I look up and uh, there's a buck literally 30 yards from us. And he's just walked out into the clearing. We're downwind. So he can't smell us. The wind's in our favor. Um, and so I go, burp, you know, his head pops up 
and my son's just frantically trying to find it in the scope, trying to, you know, get, get the sights in. He doesn't do it. And I whispered to him, I said, okay, I'm going to do this one more time, Luke. And if, and like when his head pops up, you shoot. He goes, okay. Burp. Head pops up. Boom. He gets it. Um, and the, the hug that I got from my son after, you know, he, he got his first deer. It's something that as a dad, I will always remember like the, the joy, the, um, excitement, the, you know, the camaraderie between father, son. Um, it just is something that I will treasure for the rest of my life because, um, it just was so meaningful to him, uh, meaningful to me. You know, it, it was, it was just such a grace to have. So anyway, uh, yeah, th- things have been great. Like w- with our, with our hunting season. Yeah, it's it's a really surreal moment. I mean, I haven't been hunting for that long. It's only been three or four years, and so like I can still remember my first buck, which was also my first deer. And yeah, it's an incredibly surreal moment when your adrenaline is just going out the roof, and then it all kind of comes crashing down at the same moment. And then it really is a surreal moment in in taking a life, right, and actually doing that. I mean, treating the animal with respect, and then like noticing that you got a good shot, right, so the animal's not suffering and really is actually experiencing the best end that it could, you know, possibly hope for. And, and then, yeah, just the excitement that comes from that. So that's, that's, um, that's beautiful. Did he, did he have to use muzzleloader or did he have like youth rifle season? No, it was, it was during muzzleloader season. Yeah. So, but it was a, it was a small one, uh, a small gun to be able for him to handle it a little bit more. But one of the things that we were able to do, and this is something that I, I highly encourage others to, to do as well as you're hunting, if you're, you know, Catholic or, or even Christian is like, you know, right after the, the, the kill, my son and I, you know, we stand over it and we, 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 we say a little prayer, giving thanks to our Lord, you know, and this is kind of the thing that you do even before meals, right? You know, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we're about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Like that, even that prayer right there is very fitting for the, the time in which, you know, at, right after or right after a kill um, for, you know, and, and provide uh, food for your family. So, uh, you know, that's just something that I think really resonated with with my son whenever we stopped and we prayed and we gave thanks, um, you know, f- for this opportunity and for this, you know, for the meat for our family. Uh, it really brought it home for him, I think. Uh, so oh, and I'm. I'm sure too. There's going to be a second shoot the drop there, which is when he, when you have that dinner, and he's provided the meat, right? Yeah. I have I have a buddy who his his boy, he's slightly older than yours, I think, um, went out and they got their first elk, and I just remember particularly um, him sending me pictures, not even just of like the kill and things like this, but then when the boy realized that like he had fed his family. Right, that that these things that they're going to eat over the next ninety days are all coming from something that he worked hard to do, and just like you know the the honor, right? I mean, the mm-hmm. respect that I think that that commands and that that gives like a nine to twelve year old boy is mm-hmm. tremendous. Yeah, without a doubt. It, even like we haven't had it, we've uh, haven't grinded any of the meat yet, which is uh, you know kind of freeze it, get it hard, and then kind of get it halfway unthawed and that way it's easier to grind with the mix it in with the the pig lard and things like that so we haven't done that yet we'll hopefully do that this weekend but uh you know that whole process will also be something that he'll partake in as well um which will be significant no that's wonderful well i hope i i'm gonna go elk hunting here in about two weeks so hopefully that is um successful i'm going out awesome. and handle of oklahoma yeah it should be good i haven't ever taken an animal from that property before but oklahoma like if you want to elk hunt it's a very limited capacity here we basically have some of the elk that come down from colorado uh, out in the panhandle and so but they're out there i've already gone out there and scouted once and tracked them for about a mile and i tell you what you don't realize how big they are and you're sitting there like behind a tree and i'm about 60 yards away from them and you just watch this bull come out you know from behind the shrubs and he's got this, this massive antlers Right, and they're bugling. It's amazing. I mean, it's an incredibly majestic creature. It's it's beautiful too. Yeah, I think just getting out there in the woods. I was having a conversation with one of the sisters in our diocese um, the other day, and she was asking me why I enjoyed hunting so much. And you know, <clears throat> outside just like the realism of it, of you know, actually hunting and all the skill sets I think it has to bring together, which is another reason I enjoy it. 
There's, it's a, a, a diverse set of skill sets that you have to master to do it well, particularly if you're going to take the animal from the field to the table, right? But also, I think just unplugging and being outside in nature. So even like Absolutely. the other day, I mean, all jokes aside, when I went out and sat in the rain in the ground blind, like I actually really enjoyed that. I actually right. enjoyed just being out there in the middle of nowhere and being in this rainstorm and just having that peace, not looking at my phone. And just being in nature is incredibly cathartic. Mm -hmm. Very human. It's incredibly human. And I think that's, yeah. that's one of the reasons I got into hunting is that I want to be able to pass that on to my boys. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly that being able to take it from the field to the table, uh, particularly in the same day, I think really shows them where's your food come from? What does it actually right. take to have a steak or a burger? Like, where does that actually come from? And we've habituated my family to this so much that we've now realized that my three-year-old thinks all meat that we eat comes from things dad killed, right? Like uh, that, that's, that's it, which that's is a funny, kind of, it's a funny default uh, to have. That's, that's dad done right right there. Yeah, that's good. No, I appreciate that. Well, we'll have to kind of check in as the, the season goes on. I think I told people I was going on a bear hunt. And so I, I should probably, I think we made jokes with Eli that the podcast came to a random end. Uh, yeah. Everyone would know that I failed was eaten by a bear in the Ozarks. Unfortunately, that hunt uh, was canceled because because my I was scheduled to go out the back half of that season, and they killed 500 black bears in like 10 days. They tagged out. Just tagged out, which they had not done in the previous two years. So I unfortunately was not able to do that. But I'm on the docket to go next year and to go early. So we'll see how that goes. Good, good, good. good. Well, let's jump into book 15. I'm interested to hear, hear what you have to say, and you talk me kind of off the ledge here. Uh, this whole story, like this whole book, uh, if you had to like summarize it, it would basically be like uh, Eumaeus or Eumaeus, however you want to say it, uh, tells his whole life story. And that's about it. Um, and there's a little bit more to it than that. But um, it was interesting, as we mentioned last week, how much slower of a pace it seems the Odyssey has, has, has like, in, like come in, come into, like, it's just like everything happens so fast. Boom. All these, uh, all these like things that everybody talks about at the Odyssey. And then, man, what a lull. And I remember even in the Iliad, right? Right. There was, there was some very climactic points. And then like, I think, uh, uh, book 21, book 22 is like, boom, slow it down just a little bit again. And then boom, right back up. Um, so I, like, I remember this happening in the Iliad, but man, it sure is happening again in the Odyssey. Yeah, it, I, I will agree. I agree the pace slows down tremendously. And we've kind of talked about that, right? We had a lot of the main narratives that we understand from the Odyssey, like Siren, Cyclops, Scylla Charybdis, et cetera, all jam-packed into this kind of four-book retelling by Odysseus, the King Alcinous. And now that we're back on Ithaca, yeah, I agree. I, I think the pace has slowed tremendously. We've got several books here of just being in the swine herd's hut. And even like the first, even when I was going back and reading this, I was like, oh yeah, this is where Odysseus and Telemachus are reunited. And then I realized, oh wait, no, we don't even get to that. Uh, We're not even getting to that yet. Yeah, I think that if uh, if a student was listening to us right now, he's been like trying to follow us as, you know, during school, he's been assigned the Iliad and the Odyssey, and he's trying to track with us. Um, if I were you, which I'm not, and I'm not your teacher, but you're not going to get a lot of uh, questions on your test regarding book 14 or book 15. Yeah, it's a, well, that's a dang, those are dangerous waters to go into, right? Because if you fail your course, it's not my fault. I'll tell you that right now. Like this is not on me, but yeah, I'm just giving my two, th two cents. Let's look at the text and, and see what merit, you know, we can find. Okay. So it starts off with, as we mentioned at the end of, you know, last week at the end of book 15, or excuse me, 14, that Athena has gone to recall Telemachus. And so this is, you know, line 20 or so. You know, again, I'm really intrigued here because she basically, she doesn't just wake him up and say, hey, you need to go home, which I think Telemachus probably would have obeyed. She spins this story, right, that basically the father and brothers are urging Penelope to marry Eurymachus. And, you know, and then she actually casts doubt on uh, Penelope's, you know, arete, right? You know how the heart of a woman always works. She likes to build wealth in her new groom, right? Not a memory of the dead, right? The departed husband. So I, I mean, I'm open to correction here, but, you know, I read this as a complete fabrication. 
of Athena's. And this is interesting because it recalls Athena and Odysseus on the beach together, basically, as they're sitting there, you know, kind of priding themselves in this intrigue and stories they're able to weave. And so immediately we see, <coughs> excuse me, we see Athena again kind of weaving a story to try and precipitate Telemachus coming back to Ithaca, which I don't think is overly necessary. I mean, it works, it's functional, right? I'm not entirely sure how much he believes her in the detail, but the, mm. the impetus for him to return um, certainly works. She also, the other big thing that she tells him is about the ambush, right? Because if you remember, it's been a while since we actually talked about this in Homer, but the suitors have gone and set up an ambush. So when Telemachus tries to return to Ithaca, they'll kill him. And it's a naval ambush, right? That's a, it's a boat. And so she's telling him to kind of sail a wide berth and they'll go around and basically she'll skip the ambush or he'll skip the ambush. You know, in the day, Athena, Telemachus reacts correctly. He wants to come home. He jars Nestor's son saying, we've got to get out of here. And then I do think there's a, again, there's this interesting dance that goes on with hospitality, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, here's a, here's a guest who really wants to leave and needs to leave probably for good reason. And then here's a host, and how do you, how do you handle that? And I think there was a critique either last week or the week before last. Um, someone had uh, posited a critique of King Alcinous that Odysseus very clearly wanted to leave, but King Alcinous kind of kept kept him. That was me. Yeah. That's yeah. A, yeah. Because I, I thought like you know part of guest friendship is understanding who you're like, knowing the needs of your guest. Right, it's like, oh, do you need food? Let me get you food. You, you need drink? You want good drink? Good. You need, you know, uh, you know, sheltered. Let me, let me, let me give that to you, even if it means I don't even know who you are. Um, you know, so part of me makes you makes me think like, well, is this actually good guest friendship? Not knowing what your guest needs, namely, I want to get out of here and helping facilitate that. Well, I think that Menelaus reflects your concern. Actually, there's this little idiom that I really enjoyed on line eighty one of Fagel's where he says, welcome the coming and speed the parting guest, right? So mm -hmm. he actually, like Menelaus actually, I think has a proper context for this. And so, you know, he knows they need to leave. So he feeds them and then he gives them these kingly gifts. The other thing though, I would note about this is like, I don't know, say like 95. One of the things that we've been tracking is simply the maturation of Telemachus. Like we can't lose sight because now Odysseus is home. So it's easy to lose sight of the fact that Telemachus had his own odyssey. So we need to kind of remember that he has his own coming of age story. And if you remember when he like first shows up to Nestor, he can't, he doesn't really know what to say to the king. And he really hasn't been around a lot of older men, like older men that are actually right. like his father Virtuous. figures, right? Yeah. But now he's around like Nestor and Menelaus, et cetera. So we saw him kind of stumble in the beginning. And now I think that throughout this book, there's like two times I'm thinking of, when he has to dialogue with Menelaus on, I guess, what is maybe a sensitive matter, right? That he's he's the guest, but he needs to leave. He does so pretty well. Like, he, mm. he's matured. And that was one thing I noted, um, that he's kind of matured in his speech. <laughs> yeah, I think that's interesting. I also think, like, you know, just to kind of backtrack just a, for a second with Athena telling uh, Telemachus, like, it's time to go. Like, does she actually need to weave that story? Is it true? You know, that the suitors, you know, that... Penelope finally, you know, has a suitor that's that, that, that's good. I don't know. I don't think that's actually necessary to to get him to move, to move. Or is Athena just kind of playing the odds and being like, hey, like the last twenty years, she's had a lot of suitors. This one's finally going to be the one. You know, like I don't know. Like I, this kind of, I'm kind of tongue in cheek there, but like playing, saying that she's playing the odds. I think that that's a little interesting. I'm, I don't know if it's necessary. I, I, is that um, Athena actually kind of kind of exerting her her strengths whenever she doesn't actually need to i don't know i'm not sure yeah i mean it's it's a it's similar to the the thoughts that i had on that on that passage that she's again weaving a tale and mm -hmm. it's unclear to me i don't think the tale is true and then it's unclear to me to what degree does she really have to do that to be you know effective and get right. to just come back where well, this seems to be what they do right odysseus and also athena just seem to uh lie almost out of habit Right. right. I know this. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I agree with you. Like Manolai is finally, you know, he asks, uh, tell him, do you want to go on a tour? Basically kind of show, show off his kingdom. I think that's kind of the understanding that I, I took from it. I don't know if there's another reason other than to show like, here's all the things that are mine. Uh, you know, uh, but then he realizes, no, 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 no. He wants, he doesn't want to go on a tour. Like he wants to get home. 
Imanola re- realizes this and says, okay, well, let's, let's get you home. Right. So he gives him um, a lot of kingly gifts. It's like around 110 or so. We kind of get this long uh, list of things. Helen gives Telemachus basically a wedding dress, right? Um, for your own bride to wear, or at least um, it's a, a fancy dress that is basically reserved for his future bride. Maybe. Well, I mean, be. if there's one thing Helen knows, she knows a wedding. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> it's right. probably one of her, It's like, oh, this is the one I had with. <laughs> Never yeah. mind. That I don't attacked. know. If that's the, I'm not sure that's the best person to be receiving uh, these gifts from. But yeah. the only thing I want to flag here is um, it's we can't talk about it now. But at the end, kind of at the end of the, if you remember at the end of the Iliad, we did like a ascend the great books podcast after hours and kind of went through all the interim stories between yeah. you know that yeah that's cool. um because that actually was like late at night and we were trying to like you know make it through we're we're gonna have to do something similar to that at the end of this because actually one of the big points at the end of this is what happens to telemachus and who does he marry hmm. and i think he actually marries someone that we're already introduced to and so the fact yeah. that he's kind of getting this like dress for the bride i think is something to circle back to okay um the other thing, just and maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something, but on a practical note, Menelaus, I mean, just help me walk through this. Like, Menelaus knows that the suitors are eating Telemachus out of house and home. He knows that they are bad guests. He knows that they're devouring the house. Menelaus sends him back with these kingly gifts. It's odd to me that Menelaus doesn't send him back with, like, an mm-hmm. army. Like with like an oh, army. An army. Like why why not be like, well, here are, you know, here's fifty men from my house. Right? Go go retake your home. Or go retake my friend's home, right? What I owe Odysseus out of like honor and glory and you know, hmm. et cetera. So I that's one thing I found interesting from and also Nestor to a certain extent, even though Nestor kind of gets skipped, right, on the way back. But even on the way there, like they're giving these gifts, which I think are good, uh, and efficacious. But it's interesting to me that, like, there's no war cry. There's no rally cry to retake Odysseus's home. Like, it, it's almost, like, completely predicated on Telemachus. It's like, well, we'll help you, and we'll encourage you, and you look like a god, and et cetera. Um, and here's some kingly gifts, but you have to go do this yourself. Yeah, so my raw thought here is um, I always viewed the suitors as a political threat. I never viewed the suitors as a physical threat. It seems like that the suitors are always, uh, you know, eating and drinking and like, you know, they're, they don't experience, you know, any sort of uh, temperance whatsoever. Uh, they're not men of war. It just seems like, I don't know, maybe that's a mystery on my part, but in my mind, I don't envision the suitors like, like men of war. I envision the suitors as political figures or like, you know, way like people who are trying to get in uh, via, you know, kind of sales guys, you know, trying to get in via like, oh, if I, you know, here's the shiny uh, chest of, of, of treasure. Like, you know, pick me, pick me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe he thinks like, well, it's not necessarily the, that you need an army. You just need to like go in there and, and be a man. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think they certainly are. Uh, they certainly are a political threat. They certainly represent political instability to the entire kingdom of Ithaca. Um, they do, whether or not they're actual warriors, they do represent a violent threat, right? So they, one, they've already laid an ambush to kill Telemachus, right? So it has it has escalated to a violent capacity. And two, they've already stated explicitly earlier that if Odysseus does return, they'll kill him, right? So mm-hmm. there, I, there is like a, a strong violent capacity there. I mean, you're correct insofar as like, they haven't really done anything violent per se. There's been just like a lot of talk and blustering and, and things of this nature. But it just, I don't know. It, it maybe it's just a dumb question to ask, but I, I was just sitting here kind of thinking like, why don't they rally? Like, why doesn't Nestor and Menelaus like rally to retake Ithaca for their friend, right? Even yeah. if they don't understand their friend's alive, they still can make sure to secure it for Telemachus. So I don't know. It, I don't, um, maybe there's just something I'm missing or maybe, the book answers it, but as I kind of thought about this, like practically speaking, because I think Menelaus is is a consummate host. I think he's really good. I think he's mm-hmm. a great host, um, and Nestor is to a certain degree as well, uh, even though he's long winded. Oh, he's my boy, Nestor. That dude is like the best guest guest host. Well, yeah, he does get skipped. Kind of weak. So anyway, yeah, it's, so do you it's think they come back to? 
Do you think though that the concern about him being killed again, like, is actually like in a war type of like the men are, are like going to throw a spear at him as, as he's coming up the the deal, or do you think like, oh no, you may get killed because you may get poisoned or like get stabbed in the back or something like that in an alleyway? In my mind, that's that's the concern that they have. It's like, listen, if you come back, you're going to get killed like in some fashion. I never thought of it as a, like a critical. You're going like we're going to war. You're going to get you know speared or something like that. Right. Anyway, that could be off. No, that makes sense. Are we going to talk about the bird, Oban? Yes. So he, um, just kind of like tracking through the text. So Menelaus, again, being a good host, he also has this like very piety. He has like a little libation that he does at like 160. Telemachus, again, I think if you watch his response at 170, he's matured. He understands rhetoric. He understands the courtesies, right, to offer back his host. He understands this rhetoric. And this is something too, we saw like the irony that the son of the master rhetorician Odysseus doesn't know how to speak, which again is a reflection of his fatherlessness. And so his fatherlessness here, I think has started to dissipate, particularly as he's been somewhat tutored by not only Athena, but also Menelaus and Nestor. And he's around these great men. But yeah, then, I mean, do you want to lead us through this? At like 190, there's a bird or 190 is the interpretation at 180. Uh, we get a bird omen. Yeah. So before before we do, I, I'm just like, can you help us understand like the importance of bird omens? You know, there's been a lot of these throughout the course of even the Iliad and now and, and the Odyssey. Um, the thoughts of like, okay, when a when an omen happens, typically it's a bird of some sort, right? Yeah. So this is like one of the ways that there's many different ways that you'll see in cultures that they try and uh, discern the will of the gods. And uh, a bird omen tends to be one that is indicative of Greek culture. And so inevitably, it's usually some bird of prey, usually an eagle because it's associated with Zeus. And so, you know, the birds aren't sent by accident, right? So if you're looking up, particularly at key moments, and this eagle is clutching a goose, or it's fighting a snake, or it's ran off with a lamb or whatever, then there's a, a bird omen. But then what's interesting is that, that then there's a layer then of interpretation. And it's interesting because like tonight I am teaching our diaconate program has a great book sequence. And so I have, you know, the privilege of actually teaching them the Iliad. And so mm -hmm. tonight we're going to have a small group and huddle up and uh, it's a good group of men. We're in, we're going to discuss books nine through 12. And they actually, I think it's 12 has that kind of famous scene where the Trojans are pushing the Achaeans back all the way to their ships. And there's a bird sign. And one of the Trojans says, hey, we got to retreat. That's what the sign means. It means we have right. to retreat. And, you know, Hector kind of has this famous line of like, you know, bird signs. What are you doing? Right? Like, you know, the best sign you need is bravery and virtue and fighting for your country. Now, you know, if you read it in context, he's not like a proto-secular mindset there. He actually is reading the bird sign according to what he thinks Zeus has already revealed to him. Right? So mm -hmm. he has a certain interpretation in his mind. And so here, too, I think we get the same thing where there's a bird sign and then immediately there's is there someone here who has the capacity to tell us what this means? And here we have kind of a unique omen or we have a unique seer who tells us what the bird sign means. Yeah. See, so this is my this is my problem with this bird sign. Right. So if I if I'm if I was putting myself in this situation and so at first Nestor's son, he's he sees it and he's acting. He, he says. King Menelaus, captain of the armies, what did this God send down the sign for you or for the two of us? Like he, at first, he's not even sure. Like, is this omen for me or is it for you? There's not a, a, a clear understanding. And then you get who do you get to try to interpret it to be the pr prophet, so to speak? Freaking Helen. It's like, listen, Helen, uh, you have made some bad decisions. Like your decision making process, I don't trust. You remember the whole like 10 years that we've been fighting, you know, 10 years ago? Like that's because of you. I'm not listening. I cannot believe like it's hard. It's hard for me, Deacon. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around this idea that these people, especially even Middle East, he's right there. He's like his wife who ran off with some other guy. Like we're going to trust her. We're going to trust her interpretation. How is it that the gods love her? How is it that? anybody trusts her for her like what she has to say i don't know this part really confused me as a first time reader uh because i there's no way in the world i would listen to helen i'd be like i let her finish 
just out of courtesy, like I let I let her finish, and then I'd be like, I appreciate it, Helen. Uh, you're gonna have to sit this one out. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, Helen, I think is an unlikely prophet, right? Now we've seen her kind of play this role before a little bit. We had that really haunting narrative, if you remember, in which a daemon comes upon her and she walks around the Trojan horse uh, at night when it's in Troy. And she's like calling out the names Mm -hmm. of all the men inside. And my read of it is, is that they hear her in the sound of their own wife's voice. Right. And there's this great temptation. So we've seen Helen kind of be uh, a mouthpiece, if you will, of the divine. And that one actually was a, a dark power that came upon her here. I didn't see, I was actually looking for that to see if there was any reference you know, to that spirit, to that daemon or power. I didn't see one. So no, Helen, I mean, Helen's an unlikely prophet. I will state, though, that Helen is also uh, a demigod, right? We have to keep in mind yeah. that Helen is also a daughter of Zeus, right? So yeah, she, but, she he a, has a lot of like, you know, he, he has a lot of good choices that he makes. Well, you know, so you know like, and then the, you get Telemachus who's like praising him, praising her about it, like burst into thanks for Helen. Like, oh, Helen, thank you so much. I don't know. Is, I mean, let's let's just kind of clarify it, right? So the, the bird sign is that there's an eagle clutching a white goose. And her interpretation is, is that the, as the eagle swept down, so will Odysseus sweep down on the fatted suitors, right? So the suitors are like the fat goose that's been, you know, fattening themselves up inside his own house. <clears throat> What's interesting about Telemachus's response is part of it. He says, even at home, I'll pray to you uh, as a deathless goddess is a unique phrase that uh, corresponds with Odysseus's statement to Nausicaa. If you remember, right, when mm. we talked about with Nausicaa. Um, so here, kind of you're talking about why is it Helen? Here, this is, this is kind of a, a, a nod to that divinity. Now, with Nausicaa, we thought this was kind of a nod to her being like Artemis, right? This kind of like beautiful uh, but virgin goddess that's, that's off limits, right? As Artemis is off limits to man, right? She's a virgin goddess. Um, probably not true of Helen, uh, all jokes aside. And so, but, so I, I was interested here, he uses that phrase, what is it referring back to? And I think that Helen here has acted in somewhat of a divine manner, right? Through that, she is, I mean, she is a demigod. She is half God, because um, she's a, a daughter of Zeus. So it's an interesting thing that she steps up and does this. And, and we should probably acknowledge that Helen has been self-deprecating. Right. I mean, Helen has owned to a certain degree her fault. And I think that is I think there's a certain virtue in that because I'm I still I think the jury's still out on how much free will Helen had in that entire ordeal. Sure. Right? But, I you mean, know, it'd, it'd be great, Helen, if you kind of just set this one out, though. OK, well, good. So uh, <laughs> Adam is um, not excited about Helen, the prophet. No, so I'm not. I mean, Dante, go- Dante, on the other hand, I don't know. I'm just going off of Dante. You're going off of Dante? Yeah. What's the segue there? Well, you know, Dante doesn't speak super highly of Helen. Oh, no. Yeah, she's in hell. Well, yeah. a lot of these people in this book are in hell. Dante's uh, view of them is is low. Um, not that I disagree with him, but it is low. So um, let's look at uh, around 220, if we kind of move on. Mm-hmm. We get another aspect of guest friendship or Zinnia, which is basically like, please don't drop me off at Nestor's house because he's so long winded and it's going to take forever. So again, Telemachus is trying to like be a good guest, but also is like, I really need to get home. So this is like funny because like, I feel like this is like such a teenage conversation. Like I, right. no, I mean, like I got to go like, you know, et cetera. And so anyway, that's what they do. They just drop them off at the ship. And then we kind of get, well, there's two things I would note. One is I found it odd. And now you're big. You're you're quite pro Nestor on many things. I found it really odd that um, they're concerned that Nestor will fly into a rage, right? He won't turn without yeah. you. Believe me. In any case, he'll fly into a rage. And I thought that was really interesting because I can't remember any time that Nestor even comes close to losing his temper. He seems to be such an even keeled like old man. So that was, I mean, just as someone who's like been paying, <coughs> excuse me attention to a lot of like the, the characters and mm-hmm. their just like their capacities and how Homer presents them. I, I found that to be odd. Um, I did too, because even when Nestor like goes back and talks about how like, you know, old, the men of, of the yesteryears were like so much better than the other men. Like you would think he would even 
talk about, you know, even whenever I was a young guy, I'd be in a fit of, you know, as young men do sometimes, be in a fit of rage, just slaughtering people. You know, because you talk, you know, you used to talk about like the good old days, you know, like mm -hmm. when men were, were truly men, so to speak. And just so like, I just didn't know, like, I didn't know what to make of this because it just seemed like they were pulling it out of like, like, I have no context for this because there's nothing that Nestor has ever done in in my recollection over the past, you know, Iliad and half of the Odyssey to make me think, oh, well, Nestor's a man of rage. Yeah, it was, it was just from a, like a character standpoint, I thought it was an interesting note because it's not, it doesn't fit kind of like my predetermined understanding of, of Nestor, right? Like what it's kind of come to be. Right. Anyway, I don't have um, a way to kind of unpack that. So simply something that I wanted to flag. Now we get a really interesting narrative here that as Telemachus is getting the ship ready, and basically as he's uh, pouring out a libation to Athena uh, off the ship from a far off country comes to him, a fugitive, right? And so someone who's actually killed a man. And this is just really interesting because one of the things that I... I don't quite understand is like, clearly there's a dynamic here that is akin to guest friendship, right? So like, please take me with you. Like, where are you going? Like, so Telemachus is the host. The ship is where he wants to get on and, and to go to Ithaca. When in reality, I think he just wants to go anywhere, right? He just wants to get away. And it is, I mean, there's a certain beauty to it because Theo actually appeals by these rites and the God you pray to, right? He actually sees Telemachus' piety, and that's what he appeals to, right? He says, by the rites that you're performing right now, this libation that you're pouring out to Athena, like, by that, like, you know, I swear, like, can you, you know, please take me as your guest? And, like, you know, he asks him, like, who are you? Where are you from? Your city, your parents. And Telemachus has, like, a really warm reception to this. And then he knows that he's killed someone, and he knows that they're coming to kill him. And Telemachus is just like, Sure, come and sail with us. Not only killed somebody, but killed a man of his own tribe. Right. Like, it's one thing to, like, kill a guy in war or, like, a, in, a, or in a, you know, you're upset with another, another man, but it's from his own tribe. I don't know. When I read this, I was like, golly, this, he really wants to get home. He's just like, I don't even care. Murderers, rapists, I don't care. Everybody can come on. I just want to get home. Like, I don't care who else. I have to leave this harbor. Get right. off the ship. Yeah, so, I mean... So it's interesting, and it's interesting to see then what role is this kind of prophet, um, the seer, going to play, right? It's interesting because we had Helen play this role, and there wasn't a prophet there. And now we have a prophet who just appears out of basically thin air. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, basically has mercy on him. Uh, that might be too robust of a word, but welcomes him as a guest onto his ship. I, I just, it, it kind of goes to just like this level of hospitality they have to even welcome like the fugitive. And I, it occurs to me too, cause just because I was preparing for the Iliad tonight, how much we saw this in the Iliad. If you remember the backstory of like Peleus, like Achilles father, how many of the people around him were like this? Phoenix was like this. Phoenix slept with his father's concubine <clears throat> and basically was a fugitive and was taken in by Peleus. And then also uh, Patroclus, right? Patroclus was like this. <laughs> if I remember right, Patroclus murdered someone. And mm -hmm. there was also a fugitive. So this is like another dynamic to this, that these fugitives, um, you know, if they have basically a good enough reason for murdering the person that they did, then they can be welcomed, right, as a guest and actually adopted, like, into a household. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is really bizarre. And then, like, I think the the story kind of, you know, it, it cuts from Telemachus and, and swings back over to Odysseus. And like Deacon, help me out here. I don't. It just seems like okay. So Odysseus tests Eumaeus again, or Eumaeus, Eumaeus. I don't know. Do they have tomorrow? But like, it just seems like he tests him again. It's like, what does this man have to do to prove his a, a, a allegiance to Odysseus? Like what? Like last last book, it just seemed like all he, all the man did was just you know flaunt about his his love for Odysseus and like you know how he. He protects Penelope and, you know, how, you know, it, like, is is this still a Odysseus is trying, like, doesn't believe him? Or is this another mind game that Odysseus is trying to play to help Eumaeus, like, understand, like, hey, this is actually me, 
Odysseus. I don't know. Like, I didn't know what the purpose was for him to really test him yet again. Yeah, I mean, he really is. He is testing him. He really is pushing into that loyalty where basically Odysseus kind of throws out a dumb idea of like, I'm going to go beg, you know, from the suitors. And, you know, the swineherd, you know, basically kind of walks him backwards and contextualizes like how you can and cannot do this. So in a certain way, I read it as he's still testing the swine herd, and now those tests are becoming more specific, right? So now we're going to test you in relationship to the suitor. But I agree with you, just from my vantage point, and actually, you know, working, you know, last week when we worked through book 14 with Alec, it just seems like the suitor not only has passed the test, but has passed with flying colors. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, he's actually had Odysseus's number on almost every single one of these things. And he does well here too, right? I mean, how he talks to Odysseus about the suitors, um, I think is quite good. And then we get what I think is probably one of the most fascinating parts of this whole book, which I, I think gives us a lot of insight, is we get the backstory of the swineherd. So the swineherd finally tells us um, his story. And it's really interesting. Um, and it, it transitions because Odysseus asks about his parents. And so he tells him about Laertes, which has basically been suffering grief. And he's, you know, on the farm outside of town. And then he asks about his mother. And his mother basically died of grief, right? Her boy, her glorious boy, it wore her down, a wretched way to go. I pray that no one I love dies such a death. That's around 400. And this is vague about what this actually means. And I need to, I need to do some more research into the tradition. When we were introduced, her, introduced to her in the underworld, <clears throat> in my opinion, it, it almost made her sound, or very much made her sound like a suicide, mm. right? that grief had overcome her. It's not that clear. Um, I think I'd even contextualized her as a suicide. It's not entirely clear here that grief wears her down and then she dies, a, a wretched death. But what that actually means is not terribly clear. But it's talking about the queen that actually pivots us into the swineherd's story. Because we kind of just get dropped a fact, which, hey, by the way, the queen, Odysseus's mother, also raised the swineherd. The swineherd mm -hmm. was actually raised in the royal house alongside uh, her daughter, which would have been Odysseus's sister, if I understand how this is being presented. And so that leads into the swineherd giving his whole story. And this is it. like, four. first, we see the epithet, Again, the one that Alec pointed out for us last week, the foreman of men, right? Mm -hmm. The swineherd is called the foreman of men. And <clears throat> Alec raised a really good question about, could we make any kind of um, connection between the pigs of Circe and the swineherd, the pigs here? Which I think is an interesting question to ask. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I think we're really, is really revealed here is that the swineherd is royalty. He comes from a royal line. Mm. And so to kind of give his story in sum, I mean, his father is uh, a king, a ruler, and his nursemaid uh, betrays him. The swineherd is a toddler. Uh, the swine, or excuse me, the nursemaid betrays him and is going to steal uh, the boy and some gold uh, for a passage home back to her homeland uh, for these kind of merchants, these traders. And she absconds with him, right? She kidnaps him and runs off. And I do have a few questions about how the swine herd. It, this seems to just be a phenomenal memory for something that happens to you when you're a toddler. I don't exactly mm -hmm. know maybe what age toddler actually means here. But, you know, I mean, it's actually a heartbreaking story, right? Because it's someone that he trusts. So it's, you know, grabbing my hand. She swept me through the house. And there in the porch, she came on cups and tables left by the late, latest feasters, my father's men in council. So she steals these things and steals him. You know, and she, he says that he's tagging along, lost in all his innocence. And mm. it's kind of, I mean, particularly if you have kids, I mean, I think it's a heart-wrenching tale that this trusted servant betrays, <coughs> betrays her master. I also think, though, there's a parallel here between... What Homer is giving us, I think there's a parallel here between the swine herd as this incredibly loyal servant who basically now has, you know, condescended from a royal house to a keeper of pigs, but because of a bad servant, because of an unloyal servant, 
like I think I think there's a parallel here to be made. I don't I don't think Homer is um, unintentional in the fact that the most virtuous character we have, which is a servant, that now we're finding is from good stock, right? He's from a royal family, which I think makes him as a character make a lot more sense of just his virtue, his arete, his capacity uh, as a host and as a foreman of men. Then to have like an unloyal servant be central to his story, I, I think is is a, an intentional parallel. Because what ends up happening is, <clears throat> is that Artemis actually shoots down the woman. So the woman uh, dies and she basically has no benefit. And then the crew, because um, she actually gets thrown overboard, right? Heaved her body over a nice treat for seals and fish. <laughs> in certain ways, too, there's a justice there because she's actually denied burial rights. Right, she has no no rights given to her. Or at least that's how I read it. And then they have this boy, and so they sell him into slavery. And the one who buys him is Laertes, is the father of Odysseus. Right. So that's how he ends up being in the royal home. So I, you know, I do I do think book fifteen can be. Um, I mean, I agree with you. I'm not going to defend it too much. You know, as far as it, the pace is slowed, like we don't have the mythical creatures. Like there's not a lot of action. You know, it's not the Iliad. We're not getting speared in the face. But I do think that one thing I did really appreciate in this text is the unfolding of the history of the swine herd, and that you realize that this is a man actually who who actually has uh, great virtue and actually comes from great stock, and now is a swine herd, even though he knows that he basically is a prince from another island. Yeah. So do you think? So I I I think that's very interesting, and I. I... I, maybe I was a little harsh on this book at the very beginning, but I like, it's not that I don't like it. It's just like uh, I thought I found it to be a little like disjointed a little bit from the story. Right. But I, I do like if we look around, I don't know, about 545 or so, like after he tells his story, how does King Odysseus respond? I think it's very fun, interesting that he says, and royal King Odysseus answers warmly. So like you're talking, he's talking about royalty and then, uh, Homer makes it understood that using the epithet or or maybe or just the adjective of royal, right? Uh, and then he says uh, he has such misery and he, that he's moved his heart so deeply and uh, with with his long tail, such pains and sorrow. But true, look at the good fortune Zeus sends you hand in hand with the bad. Uh, and then he says, uh, I think this is the part that really thought uh, I found interesting is that uh, he said like. I'd say it's a fine life that you lead, better than mine. I've been drifting through cities up and down the earth, and now I've landed here. I found that very interesting, and I'm not really sure. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a much more philosophical understanding of this than than what I'm leading on to. But it just seems very interesting that Odysseus, maybe he's just buttering him up, or maybe he's just being kind and saying that it's better than his. But it, I do find it interesting. That he sees, like, oh, look, you're a, you now are royalty, and look what you're doing in some capacity. That uh, the swineherd is leading a better life than he. Yeah, I think that there's no. I, I like that. I think that there. One of the things that I wrote down was, you know, is there not a self commentary from Odysseus going on here, right? Because basically, Odysseus is commenting on the man's um, suffering, but saying, look, Zeus has also given you good things, and like you're you're pulling through this. Which it's hard not to think that Odysseus is being empathetic there because, you know, Odysseus, the one who suffers, the one that the gods hate, is actually giving some kind of self-commentary on this, right? So, no, I, I think that there's, um, there's a dance going on here between mm -hmm. the swineherd and Odysseus. And again, I think like last week, I think we were kind of suspicious of how much the swineherd is actually aware of things. I'm, I'm waiting to unpack that when there is a reveal of who Odysseus is and to see mm -hmm. how the swineherd actually responds. The other thing I'm waiting for is to watch how the swineherd and Telemachus interact. Because I think that uh, the swineherd being so royal, and if you remember, he has this like masterful understanding of his Lord's assets, not even, not even just the pigs, just of all of them, right? He keeps track of these things. He somewhat is keeping track of uh, the mom and the dad. And he also knows in somewhat running interference for Penelope on these beggars. Like he really is playing almost a steward role, if that makes sense, which I think is the role that Mentees was supposed to play, if you mm -hmm. remember. Mm -hmm. um, and so this guy's just like high capacity. This is a high arete guy, right? I mean, he he seems very spirited. 
um, in, but in a simple way, if that makes right. He has a thumas, but it's, it, it's playing out in a simple but beautiful way. So I, I, I'm really glad you said that because I, I read this, at, you know, as, again, as a first time reader, I read this as Odysseus having a self-reflection, realizing that he has not been virtuous. Like he has hmm. not been virtuous with his men. He is not like that. They kind of both started out from the same, you know, the same stock, so to speak. Uh, and now there's a self-reflection or maybe even like a self, oh, I don't know, like not deprecation, but like, you know, he, he, he's feeling very remorseful for like, oh, wow, look at this. Look at you who have, you know, ha- have experienced, like have, have shown virtue and like you to live a simple life, yet how wise you are. And like, I've been, you know, I'm the cunning guy. I'm the wise guy. I'm, you know, I'm doing all these things, but am I being virtuous? Like, is this actually like who I am? Um, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I found that to be kind of self-reflective and maybe I'm reading too much into it. Maybe he's just buttering him up, trying to make him feel good about himself. But I found that to be very interesting. No, I think there's a contrast going on. I mean, Homer just drops this incredibly virtuous character out of nowhere. Right. Right. As we've kind of seen Odysseus retell his own story. And so I do think there's a great juxtaposition that is happening. <clears throat> and I think also Odysseus looking at someone else who has suffered and, and has suffered tremendously, but then has embraced his suffering and his new station in life uh, with such, I mean, dare I even say humility, mm. right? With such a self-reflection. I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of want to push a little bit and say, like, this is the arete of a simple life, mm-hmm. right? That this is who he is. And that, and that his spiritedness, his thumas, can actually be, be played out even without you know, the grandiose deeds of sacking Troy or surviving Skill and Charybdis or, you know, Achilles or Agamemnon or any of these guys, is there not a simple spiritedness that's played out here in the kind of magnanimity, the great soldness that we see in the swineherd? So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I think it's something that we need to track simply because the pace has slowed tremendously. We're actually right. going to get a lot more interactions with the swine herd. And then also I'm interested to see how the swine herd then, like, how does he interact with the suitors? What does he do when Odysseus comes? What is his role in retaking Ithaca? So, you know, because we're putting him on a pedestal here. Right. And so, like, what, you know, what's going to happen? So, yeah. Anything else in book 15 that you can think of? This I mean, important? just, you know, just simply the, excuse me, the round off the narrative, you know, uh, Telemachus returns. And as he returns, um, there is another bird sign. And so oh, now yes. there's a prophet. Yeah. And so we kind of have these bookended bird signs in this, in this text. Mm-hmm. And we do have a, an interpretation basically that, you know, no line more kingly than yours in all of Ithaca, yours will reign forever. And Telemachus, I think, handers, handles this uh, in a somewhat subdued way. And then it ends with uh, the prince kind of makes lodgings for his friend, the prophet, and then it ends with uh, kind of the anticipation of the fact that Telemachus goes walking off to go talk to the loyal swineherd. And so then we're building up what we think is going to happen, uh, you know, next week in the next book. Book, what is that, 16? Mm-hmm. Uh, in which Odysseus and Telemachus are reunited. Now, granted, we don't know what that looks like because he's in the guise of a beggar. We There's also- no way Homer's going to let us down, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Telemachus has never seen his father. Right. Grows up, right. I mean, that's one thing to think about. Uh, Odysseus saw him as a baby. He's never seen his father. Mm-hmm. And so what is this going to like look like? I should mention just, you know, for those as we kind of work through our year of Homer, we have a lot of good things coming up. So in book 16, um, we have Dr. Adam Cooper of Wyoming Catholic College. So next week, mm-hmm. uh, he'll be joining us to walk us through that. And then book 17 and 18. Uh, we have Dr. Jared Zimmerer of Benedictine oh, yeah. College. Um, Dude, I bet you can't lift as much weight as he can. I cannot. He is in shape. Yeah. Um, he's in shape. I, yeah. I can't either. Like, I think about, no... um, again, I'm teaching the Iliad tonight, so I think about Hector like, uh, you know, I bet Dr. Jared Zimmerer can lift a boulder that no two other men could lift. That's right. right? That's, and, he, yep. and he goes chunking it through gates and uh, Achaean walls and other such things. And then in book 19, <laughs> we've signed up uh, Mary Pat Donahue, who actually is. Oh, the, cool. Uh, if you don't know who she is, she is the Secretariat of Education uh, on a national level for the USCCB. 
uh, lover sure, of great books, yeah. lover of classical education. So she's going to be uh, joining us. And uh, then we've got a couple other people coming down the pike. Uh, Deacon Adam Conk, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. Uh, my boy, Deacon Adam. He's awesome. Yeah. I love that guy. Good friend of yours. I've had the privilege of meeting him uh, once or twice. Uh, we also have Jeremy Tate uh, from the Classic Learning Test is going to uh, join us as well. And then I just got an email today that we're going to reschedule Dr. Jennifer Frey from the University of Tulsa's new Honors College, which is a great books-based college, and she's going to join us uh, as well. So we've She's got, just a delight. I love is, her. She's awesome. She is wonderful. Follow her on Twitter. Actually, a lot of the people I just mentioned are actually on Twitter yeah. or X or whatever I'm supposed to say. So yeah. you know, please follow them. So we've got a great lineup to kind of round out our year of Homer. It's awesome. And like, like we've said before, but just as a reminder, guys, all of our study guides and, and things that are on our website, you go check that out. Uh, the Great Books. Wow. Sorry. The Great Books Podcast.com. I just, uh, I'm out of whiskey, so I don't know what to do, I guess. Um, the Great Books Podcast.com. Uh, it'll be a, a huge help for you and, and your team that you guys are, are reading together. Um, anything else, Deacon? Nope, I just appreciate it. I hope everyone enjoys uh, this dialogue and looks at our question and answer guide and I hope your small groups are going well and I look forward to kind of rounding off this year of homework. Awesome. We will see you next week. See you.